The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll sell be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Dash was formed in April 2022 following a merger with financial planning software firm Raw Software, wealth platform software specialist Neo, and platform technology provider WealthO2. Dash is the first advice technology company to focus on solving problems across the end to end advice process. Dash helps. Dash's modular approach allows advisors to tailor their best of breed tech stack helping streamline processes and leaving advisors time to focus on maintaining their clients' experience. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm pumped to be here with Rebecca Pritchard. Rebecca is a Senior Financial Planner at Rising Tide Financial down in Melbourne. Just had a great chat on the pod with uh, with. Maddie Hale from that group as well, um, and keen to to pick Beck's brain about her advice journey, um, some of the things that she's learned from focusing on younger clients and, and the lessons learned. Rebecca, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Look, uh, I know that you're sort of you know got quite a profile in, in the industry, you know, regularly listed on the the um, FS Power Fifty, etc. But for anyone that hasn't heard of you, can you maybe give us a short version of your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today? Yeah, definitely. So I I think I've got a, a great background in advice. So I started as a client. Um, I got advice when I was 23, I think it was 22, 23 with my then boyfriend, now husband. And I was working in corporate finance at the time. Um, and I knew that that wasn't my forever job, but I wasn't sure what was next for me. And through the advice process, was able to articulate my values, my goals, and identify that I loved advice. I loved going through it. I was like the most obsessive client you've ever seen. And eventually uh, within a sort of a couple of years, I retrained uh, from corporate finance into personal finance and called up my advisor and said, can you create a job for me? Um, So then transitioned into that role. So I was in a um, a small self-licensed business for sort of five-ish years um, and then went through another transition, similar similar time to starting a family as well, where I joined the Rising Tide practice um, and have been there for just just over three years now. Was that where you were a client of Wealth Enhancers? Is that where you started? Yeah. I feel like Wealth Enhancers are responsible for a few new entrants into advice. Obviously, they're doing a lot of things right over there. I know um, Jess Brady, one of the hosts of the XY podcast, was a client of theirs that sparked a passion for her in financial advice, ended up becoming a financial advisor. So, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's awesome uh, to see. I wonder how many more they can take credit for. Yeah, it's a, it, it's, it was a great breeding ground and, you know, I think it really shaped how I think about advice and has made me a fundamentally better advisor because I live and breathe this myself personally as well as practicing it with clients. Absolutely, and it's certainly relatability for clients. Like I know that we've got – we hired one of our clients as a um, relationship manager in the business and her speaking from personal experience to people that were considering getting financial advice was a huge help because you could talk about all of the the ins and outs. And I think that as advisors, sometimes you can get a bit blinded to the things that, you know, you, you deal with day in and day out. Having that different perspective can be super valuable for, for someone, you know, going on that journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. 
I, so you were at Wealth Enhancers. You were there for like five years, kicked a whole bunch of goals there. Then um, we merged with Rising Tide. Can you talk us through like how you went about establishing yourself in, a, in an established business in, in Rising Tide and finding your feet there? Yeah, well, it was sort of a two-step process. So I actually joined Rising Tide um, and with just a clean, clean break. Um, so I had to start from scratch in terms of establishing my client base there. Um, I was, I had a four and a half month old baby. I was coming back from maternity leave and it was, it was really daunting. Um, also, uh, two weeks into starting that job, we went into our first lockdown back in 2020. So that was, that was nice. just a whole lot, a whole lot going on back then. It was really hard mm. to go from, being really successful in a previous practice to, to starting from square one and feel like you're failing because um, mm. you're also trying to talk a different language from a different licensee and different systems and, and just learning a slightly different way of doing advice. So uh, it was it was daunting and overwhelming a lot of the time, but I also felt incredibly supported by Matt and the team at Rising Tide of, you know, we also brought you in here because we don't want you to do things exactly the way we do things um, mm. and we're or back you in to sort of break a few things and, and find your feet um, as you go. I don't think, well, no one anticipated that we were all going to be doing that remotely. We, we sort of thought we would yeah. be belly to belly a bit along that way. So I, I suspect that that did drag some of that transition out a bit. Mm. Um, but, you know, for, for me, I certainly having the confidence in building that up in the previous organisation, like I knew I could do it here. Um, yeah. and, and it was just a matter of just putting one foot in front of the other to, and know that like in time you will deliver what you mm. want to. And how did you balance that? Cause it's, I imagine it would be hard enough making that transition under, um, like, you know, when you're just in regular career mode, but with you coming off the back of mat leave with the, with four and a half month old bub, how did you, how did you tackle that? And how did you find balance? Yeah, it was, um, it was pretty brutal. Like, uh, you know, I was working three days a week. I was taking, you know, two expressing breaks during the day as well as lunch breaks to, you know, um, make sure I could keep mm. breastfeeding. The, it, it was, it was really hard to find a rhythm. Um, I, it took me a little while, probably a good couple of months before I accepted that that was the rhythm and that it was just vastly different to what I expected it and what I had had in a previous life. Um, mm. and, and so there was, there was definitely some, uh, adjustments of my expectations. It was managing expectations of the business as well, but then also having faith that again, once time rolls out, like it will wash out. Um, yes. and uh, Matt, like Matt and the team, like they hired me when I was like a hundred weeks pregnant. So they, everyone yeah. knew what we were getting into to some degree. <laughs> um, and and so we were all playing the long game. Um, we, mm. It was probably a little bit clunkier than we had hoped at the start. Um, and, and, and to be fair as well, uh, five months into joining Rising Tide, I was I had to tell Matt I was pregnant again. So, but again, that was that was sort of a strategic career decision to you know bunch the kids up so that mm. then we could get that done and and crack on. <laughs> Chaos is the new normal, I think. In, in, I, the, in that I always say go down in a blaze of glory. <laughs> That's it. Yep. My wife and I had ours pretty close together and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's intense, but um, it does get you through that period in a, in a slightly shorter, shorter yeah. amount of time. Well, so. I feel like I'm largely on the other side of it now. So I've been, I, I came back to, um, to work October of last year after my daughter was born and, and so sort of, was that 15, 15 months ago? And like, it's actually a really great rhythm now. And I'm, I'm really happy with that sequencing decision as much as you can control mm. it. Not you can't always do it that way. Um, yeah. But I, and I also was a lot kinder on myself um, in terms of expectations this time around. Yeah, it's a little bit easier when you have some sort of uh, idea as to, to what, what to expect exactly. Yeah. Um, Beck, what, what does an average client look like for you and, and where do they come from? Uh, I'm really pleased that most of my clients are referrals um, and, and and so that's, that's incredibly rewarding. Uh, so my average client would be a mid-30s professional woman or a early 30, early to mid 30s um 
couple who are either have young children or are, are thinking about starting a family, you probably laugh and be like, that's just you looking in the mirror, Rebecca. But um, yeah, that's exactly who I love to work with. And it's really great and to be talking about that stuff every day when you're going through it every day as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of advisors tend to, you work with people like you, you can re- relate to yeah. the challenges, the opportunities, you're well, you can learn sort of going through the same well. things yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know that you do a lot of work with, um, you know, equity and superannuation. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. It's it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about because, you know, we, we, we know that there is uh, a gender pay gap. We know that there is a gender superannuation gap. And, uh, you know, I think I'm incredibly privileged to be actually in a position to do something about that. Um, and so I love having conversations with my clients to actually address, you know, I guess moving away from the anchoring of, you know, the traditional woman or mum takes 12 months off parental leave, dad takes one to two weeks off. Um, we, no one talks about superannuation, mum works part-time, and then we compound the implications of that for the next 20, 30 years. So having more active conversations with clients to address that parental leave period, um, making sure it's based off what people actually want, um, but then also looking at the superannuation uh, side of things to make sure that women, because it is overarchingly women, are not financially penalised for the pretty incredible and um a substantial role of of you know carrying birthing and caring for for, for children um it's been fascinating actually in the last couple of years that i haven't had a single uh, man or partner dad uh say oh no i don't like that idea everyone actually mm. jumps at it going oh i didn't know that was an option like when you look at something like contribution splitting they're like, oh, that's fantastic. That's like, let's do that. And they're so excited that there is an avenue that they can use that balances the scale. And and they're just, they're pumped at it. Totally. Yeah. I know some of the stats out there are, are pretty scary around um, uh, around some of those gaps and, and shortfalls, but particularly for women. Um, I have to admit, and I, I said this to you offline as well, that uh, we we tend to not do a lot of contribution splitting. And I had the the thought around that, that, you know, in the event of a relationship breakdown, that typically assets are divided, you know, as per whatever the, whatever the court's decision is or whatever the agreement is around that with superannuation included as um as one of those assets that's as part of the pie what are some of the things that people may not have thought about though uh, around the the practical implications there from a really practical or an execution perspective we see that that simply doesn't actually happen when it comes to superannuation in reality so the division of assets tends to be um often anchored around the family home um and again if you've got a, a woman who it, has a primary caring responsibility that tends to be lumped in together. Uh, but I also, like, I think that's logical when you when you start to explore it, but I also like to unpack the couple of really behavioural um, or emotional components of this as well around, you know, the, the value of that people have of financial security when they log in or they, they check in their superannuation account and just simply seeing that there is money there because, again, let's, Let's hope that no one actually does get divorced, um, even though we, mm. we know that that is simply not the case. So particularly when you've got, let alone people who are working part-time, but you've got people who aren't in the workforce or aren't in the paid workforce at all, to see that there's still funds going into their superannuation account um, provides an enormous amount of financial security. It also validates um, the role that they're playing in their household, um, which is twofold. It gives them that sense of value, but it also illustrates to the working partner that they are performing a role that is incredibly valuable. I mean, you could easily expand this conversation into talking about the underinsurance of women or homemakers um, in Australia yeah. and and not adequately quantifying the value of that role. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think we we know a lot about the the intangible benefits of financial advice for that peace of mind and confidence, but don't I I know I'm certainly guilty of not always applying it in that, you know, with that particular lens. So I think that that makes a ton of sense. Um, Well, even um, if I may just build on that a little bit further, one of the the 
I guess, uh, conversations, the spirited conversations that we've had even at Rising Tide is, you know, potentially around like tax deductions of additional contributions um, and how it makes sense often to be putting it in the higher income earner's name because you get a bigger tax mm. deduction. Um, mm. which absolutely makes sense. Um, but then potentially a strategy like contribution splitting can give you the benefit of that tax deduction, but then the the equity at the end of the day. Or even going, sometimes tax deductions aren't the be-all and end-all. Like, do we just place less of an emphasis on that and more of an emphasis on the the feeling of security and the feeling of equity? Absolutely, yeah. And I think we apply that with saving strategies and sometimes like I know for us, we talk about with clients, sometimes it, it's obviously it's optimal to have all of your money in an offset account, but sometimes having all your money in one big pile doesn't give you the same benefits of motivation of seeing your savings growing or the clarity on, you know, where your spending is coming from and those sorts of things. So I think that absolutely uh, translates and the, the motivation psychology piece we know feeds into then better results and more over time and better habits and those sorts of things. So yeah, I, th- I think it, uh, it it's certainly something that I'm going to reconsider off the, off the back of this chat. So uh, awesome. no doubt there'll, there'll be a few. That's a win for today. <laughs> totally. Beck, what, what have been, you've been at it for a while. What have been some of the biggest shifts in, in what you do or, or how you do it as an advisor? Uh, I've loved sort of seeing, hearing, watching the how commonplace like goals and values-led advice is now. Um, mm. you know, I feel like when, when I came into the industry, the way that we were operating felt a little bit woo-woo, um, mm. and the, the sort of like a bit of the, um, the black sheep of the family. And, and so I love mm. as, a, you know, if you think about the benefit of for the Australian community, I love how common that is now. I love that, like there's genuine competition and a thriving marketplace for advice. Um, I know that the number of advisors is, is dwindling, but you know, I think good advice businesses are flourishing. Totally. Um, and, and that I think is really, really encouraging. I, I think one of the challenges to sort of look a little bit further down the track is fueling like the talent pipeline, the draft coming through out of, out of universities and, you know, even something as simple as like my pathway, you know, I'd done my, my commerce degree. I decided I was going to change careers. I did a my RG146 of a night time whilst working full time and then I walked straight into a job. Like that 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 pathway mm. doesn't exist anymore. Um, mm. And, you know, there's a whole lot of positive that have come from the changes of education standards, but I, I do also, I am conscious of making sure the hurdles are not too high to encourage people to take creative pathways into the industry as well as the more conventional, you know, coming up from university or straight out of school. Yeah, totally. It definitely does place some restrictions, particularly for career changes. Like I know we've been, or we've been growing and hiring through the last few years and spoken to a few people and they come from, you know, sort of uh, aligned, broadly aligned, you know, maybe somewhere in finance or someone senior in another career path and, looking at coming to the industry, they're bringing a lot of skills that would allow them to become an advisor, you know, reasonably quickly from a, you know, understanding the technicals, understanding the client management side, and then doing that delivery. But when you look at what do they need to do to then, um, you know, meet the, meet the current standards, which overall I think are are great, um, but it, it does become difficult. And then also, from a from a REM perspective, like people have got anyone that's more established, you got commitments and things that you need to deal yeah. with. So it does it does add another dimension to figuring out how you can make it work. And I think we're fortunate that we probably as a business we're a little bit more built for that than than some others that I'm aware of. And I know that there's a lot of out there that are, but there's also a lot of businesses that really aren't. Like they they're not yeah. um, they don't have the internal sort of capabilities or the growth that's allowing them to. Um, bring in people, get them the exposure without sort of pigeonholing them into a into a, a admin role or a CSO role for an extended period of time. So it does, it's definitely something that needs to be addressed. So I'm um, quite sort of heartened by seeing some of the changes, that, the things that are coming out there. I know that um, 
uh, Tal have got a thing uh, around this. I know at XY we've been talking a lot about this and the, the you know the pathways and how do we get more people in there because there's there's a definite gap as you say. Good advice businesses are flourishing. People are wanting more advice. We're also seeing more advisors for younger people. There's more people you know like growing cohort of people that are getting advice or looking for advice. Quality of advice is increasing, so that that sort of feeds the beast even more. You got more demand, so it's definitely something that we need to um, need to address to, to to make sure that we can deliver. Good to see some positive things there, but I think there's probably still a little bit more work to, yeah, to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but but I think the technology side of things is always encouraging as well. It, it, I don't think it ever moves as fast as you think it's going to. Um, no, but. Uh, the, but I, I certainly I can reflect on what things look like uh, eight years ago or ten years ago compared to today, and at least I know we're going in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Beck. You you've mentioned a few things already, but what have been some of the biggest challenges for you on your advice journey? <laughs> Most recently, like sw- switching licensees or going from self license to license was was a challenge that I did not give appropriate emphasis to beforehand. Um, I felt like I had to learn a different language. Um, I'm really pleased that I am fluent in that new language now or close to. Uh, yeah. But that that was probably more of a time and an energy investment than than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. I think like I'm a reasonably confident person which has served me very well through a few transitions and that that sort of is I guess I mean internally encouraged <laughs> through, mm-hmm. through through the the adversity but I also recognize you know that the people that I work with or my client base have been somewhat sh- sheltered from like some of the large financial um, like market events uh, probably the closest mm-hmm. I've, I've come in is in the last six months of of seeing clients under stress with uh, rising interest rates Mm. um, because Mm. historically like market movements hasn't really bothered my clients because they're investing for years and years down the track whereas uh yeah this shifting interest rates and the sense of uncertainty is a completely different equation um because again like i guess the the cohort of people i work with got through the pandemic reasonably unscathed as well if not were able to save and accelerate so this yeah i'm i'm enjoying the the challenge and i guess it helps as well to be personally experiencing it you know i've got a mortgage yeah. as well to to go okay what is what does this look like i just got off a call with a client this morning who who told me that it was simply impossible to get a grocery shop below 240 dollars a week um sorry below 300 uh, a week for a family of four um mm. and like it's it's funny how often financial planning comes down to conversations about groceries and meal planning. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I think but, yeah, ha- having, some... yeah, having conversations about that is like, all right, like let's roll up the sleeves, like let's let's talk about this. What are we what are we eating this week? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny when you you end up in conversations like that, and it's like it seems like it's a world away from you know markets and uh, technical financial advice, but these are the things that that do that's what some people's mind the dial yeah exactly and i think we you like me like i've been i've been registered for a bit over 10 years through the last 10 years it's like we've just seen interest rates going down and like massive run up in equities markets and uh not seen inflation and not seen you know these uh these sorts of pressures and i think you you know you're working with younger clients like we are as well that a lot of them haven't seen it either that they're just starting to sort of hit their straps from a wealth building perspective taking on more financial commitments and now it is uh, sort of changing the game so like you it's a it's a it's a new challenge i think it's, for a lot of younger advisors to be dealing with yeah and spe- like specifically dealing with a lot of young families as well like it's at a time where you're financially the most vulnerable because you've got you know probably the highest expenses if you've got kids in childcare and possibly mm someone not working or working less than full time and you know I'm really grateful for the, the the coaching and education I've had in um in both Rising Tide and at We to, to help people work through their values and and articulate what's important because we're making trade-offs today that we just didn't think we were going to have to make um mm. and it's been really interesting actually for the first couple of months where we were seeing interest rates rise and, and clients were far more inclined to reduce their savings or investments than they were to actually change their behavior. 
Um, mm. Whereas, you know, you fast forward another few months um, and either they've got no more room to move <laughs> with the savings or investments or they're, mm. they're realising the flow and implications of doing that for too long. Um, and, and again, like this, this generation, like we've lived a pretty good life. We, you know, we think about during pandemic times, it's like, well, that's where you, you got your really fancy takeaway because you couldn't go. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and so actually going, well, you know, maybe, maybe we can only get two pundits of strawberries this week instead of three or like, where, where are we prepared to make trade-offs? Um, and it's like, it's just a different f- it's a different type of fitness that or different muscle that we, we haven't got a fitness or a strength in yet. But mm. the more we flex it, the more we train it, I know that we will. That's right. Yeah. And things will get easier again. It's so it's like when you work with a client and they they might either run into something unexpected financially or run up a bunch of debt that they need to deal with, sometimes flexing that muscle and getting used to you know, spending less or work, making them, your money work means that when you do get into a stronger position, it makes everything else a lot easier. You can take yeah. your foot off the pedal a bit, but still, you know, be doing more to build and, and actually grow. So, yeah, yeah I, look, I think at a social level, I think this is actually really healthy for the community. Um, you yeah. know, I completely appreciate there is a lot of people who are under genuine financial stress at the moment. So I'm not talking about those people, um, mm. but for those who are, you know, have had high discretionary income to to learn how to yeah develop this sort of strength or this sort of fitness is will be a great you know thing to to carry into the future absolutely Beck, i could i could chat about this all day but uh i won't um my last <laughs> question for you is is that if you could if you could wind back the clock to you know your uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed self coming into advice and do one thing differently, what would it be? Oh, I don't know. I feel pretty pleased with how I've gotten to this point. I, I, I probably would encourage myself to just keep keep doing what I'm doing. I think about uh, perhaps things like social media or publishing content or articles and um, I remember s- listening to Gary V like a number of years ago of just mm. telling people to get out of their own way. Like everyone's super self-conscious at the start. And I reckon I probably wasted or spun my wheels for a couple of years just being too nervous or self-conscious to, to take action yeah. there. And I, and I think about the value that being being social and being sort of loud in, in financial health and wellness has, mm. has served me as well as serving the community and people who consume the content that I create you know, I, it'd be nice to know that I hadn't pissed away a couple of years um, fretting. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so that would probably be the one thing just to, like, encourage encourage myself to, like, get out of my own way and just do things as well. Yeah, I love that. I um, I, I think it's, I think it is sort of part of the journey. Like, obviously, I do a lot of content as well, and I know the early days I still remember Phil Thompson, who was big on video, you know, one of the first younger advisors that I saw that was really crushing it in that space and doing, uh, he was kind enough to lend a hand and went down to his office down in Melbourne and like I had all these things scripted out and it was like literally recording stuff sentence by sentence and then spending hours chopping things together and it still looked atrocious. Um, (laughs) But, uh, you know, soon enough you come to realise that uh, that you, you want to be who you are, and it probably doesn't matter if you stuff the odd thing up or you, you know, you mince your words a little bit. That sometimes that's probably a better thing because people can see that you're people, and then that makes them actually connect more than you know some awesome robot that's like spouting off whatever uh, it is. But yeah, I think it's it's definitely a good advice to just lean into that journey sooner and get there, and um, obviously it has an impact as well. In your initial video, were you wearing like a muscle tank top, or were you in a shirt? <laughs> uh, I think I feel it was like wearing, my, yeah, my dress code sure. has changed over the years yeah, as I've fully. gotten more confident in my own skin. <laughs> totally, yeah. Ironed and pressed, probably had the good <laughs> uh, the the good shirt with buttons on it as well. I don't think I own too many of those these days, and uh, yeah, have been known to do to, to do a little TikTok from the beach in my uh, in my bucket hat. So. 
Yeah, I think yep. uh, it's funny how much emphasis you place on things and then you come to realize that they're probably not as important as... Uh, or as they you, might you actually be distracting from what you're trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Beck, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It's great to see, um, yeah, great to see you kicking those goals and um, yeah, look forward to watching on from the sidelines. Oh, thanks for the support and loved having the chat today.